What's happening? Wait a minute. Let's get to recording. I had a really interesting experience yesterday in which there seemed to be a, a kind of battle going on. I feel like not too long ago, yesterday would have been a bad day. But I noticed that it was only a bad day when I thought it was a bad day and a lot of the rest of the time I was able to just be happy. And then some bad feelings would arise again and I'd catch myself thinking, having a bad day and then a couple of minutes later I'd be happy again and I'd go hang on <laughs> I thought I was having a bad day and this went on throughout the day and I found it quite tiring but what was the most tiring I would assume the most tiring part was when you were telling yourself over and over again the lie that it was a bad day Actually, no, I found the, the most tiring thing to be um, the moments where I kind of tried to muscle in with joy, <laughs> where I caught myself and checked myself and said, nah, -uh, we're doing happiness. All right. Well, let me congratulate yourself, uh, you for that, because that tiring aspect is actually mental exercise based in uh, right effort right to keep coming back mm -hmm. that a year or two or more ago you could have convinced yourself that it was in fact a bad day early in the day and then gone around the whole day with confirmation bias proving yourself right over and over and over again what a bad day <laughs> bad day and not only that but we have something to blame the day <laughs> it's the day that's bad and i've got nothing to do with it right? <laughs> so congratulations for waking up thank you and it needs to be done over and over and over again because your only other option is to say it's a bad day over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, and that that um, illustrates uh, a feeling that I have of that I'm too deep down the rabbit hole now. I can't I can't get back. <laughs> yes, in fact, the Zen has the analogy of the Zen cup or the broken cup. You've said this All right. Yeah. Right. That in fact, uh, uh, the busting of the cup is the breaking down of the of the delusions that the cup is broken. Now we get <laughs> we cannot use this cup anymore to hold delusion. The cat's out of the bag, so to speak. Yeah. Or the bag's yeah. got a hole in it now, something to that effect. So even if you put the cat back in the bag, it'll just come right back out again. <laughs> and that's kind of scary. No, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful it's, too. <laughs> it's wonderful to recognize that you, in fact, have no more excuse. Right. For being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it means that it feels to find myself in, in a, an easy place again. There's a kind of, there's the ignorance is bliss thing, right? Right. Well, this is why it's important to keep for the <laughs> for someone like myself who is constantly talking about it the thing that needs to be talked about is right sati and then right effort mm -hmm. now 
Um, the thing that's really interesting is when this is put together with the uh, seven factors of enlightenment, where sati becomes unremitting, uh-huh. and the, which means it keeps coming back. Uh-huh. All right, which is exactly what's happening to you. You're beginning to develop unremitting mindfulness, which this- is the first factor of enlightenment. Now, what do we mean by that? That even though you're in the habit of telling yourself it's a bad day over and over and over again, uh-huh. you won't let that drum be the only one that's beaten. Okay. Okay. All right. That you keep unremittingly come back and beat the drum that you want to beat rather than having that old drum Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. beating on and on. So that's the first thing. Now, the second one is unremitting investigation, which goes right along with that. But the third one is when our energy becomes unremitting. But the but the word energy here is often misconstrued. We're really talking about one's right effort. And when one's right effort becomes so right that it becomes effortless, then it becomes an energy on its own or a motivation. Right. And I feel like um... that you're developing that right now. Uh, and and I've got no choice but to just keep paddling. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. I just want to write those three down. The second was. What three things are you writing down? The the three factors of enlightenment that you just mentioned. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, the first one is unremitting sati, unremitting mindfulness, unremitting keep coming back mm-hmm. to remember that we're Dhamma dudes now. Keep remembering. All mm-hmm. right. That mm-hmm. very first sati was when the mind wanders away from the breath. We, we recognize that the mind has wandered away from the breath. Mm-hmm. And... We start again with the breath. Now Mm -hmm. we're doing exactly that same thing, except that we've changed a couple of words in there. Whenever the mind wanders into, oh, it's a bad day. We see that, we recognize it, and we come back and we take a deep, happy breath. And we say, oh, this is not such a bad day after all. (laughs) Okay, so it's actually the same practice, except that by doing it over and over and over again, you're developing it now as a skill. Mm -hmm. And that the original skill that started to be developed needed that isolation. It needed the seclusion. So that there was only one thing to do. But now that we're off the cushion, we're free from that cushion, and we're out in the world... Now what that means is, is there's a flood coming. In fact, here it is. Here it is again. (laughs) Here it is again. (laughs) There's an absolute flood of Mm -hmm. things that we were able to seclude ourselves from. So the the Buddha's analogy of the, uh, the, 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 (laughs) I like the little rhyming verse, the the log in the bog. Yeah, he's mentioned that before. Yes, the log in the bog is when um, I don't know how the analogy works other than that, other than you cannot set the log on fire and get it going while it's soaking wet. Mm. But once the log is dried out, Mm-hmm. By bringing it onto the land, now we can put it to use. Okay, we can set it on fire. We can do with it as we please. Uh, right. So we recognize now that going back into the bog is dangerous, mm-hmm. and that we need, in fact, some waterproofing. <laughs> and it, it feels like that's that's the moment of hard work is dragging the log out of the bog. Right. Right. And it and the log is still kind of wet. It's not dried out yet. If it hasn't become waterproof. Mm-hmm. All right. And so the waterproofing would be constantly mindful of not allowing any water in. 
but unfortunately the student is not so lucky or not so skilled and so the log does get bogged and in fact it starts to sink once it gets waterlogged again and now it's completely drowned mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in its in its own <laughs> right. its own so, wet making yeah i feel like yesterday was an example of a day in which i would have submerged myself in the bog except that you didn't except that didn't except that you didn't you kept paddling your way back out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's excellent. Mm -hmm. So now this is in fact a major kind of point. If I can somehow talk you into it. Oh, I believe you. You ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was I was sure to congratulate myself. All right. Well, here's the thing. Is, is that there is that one first step on the noble path. The first step of the path of the Sotapan is when the student can say that, that he knows for sure and has demonstrated it and found out for sure it's himself that no matter how obstructed the mind gets, he can in fact clean it out and come back to the here now and see the things the way they really are. See the truth as it is. Right here, right now. All right. So you have just demonstrated to yourself time after time after time after time in an unremitting way that no matter how many times your mind says, oh, this is a bad day. Damn the day. It's the day's fault to make me feel so bad or something like that. Mm -hmm. that no matter how many times that happens, no matter how many times the mind gets obstructed, and no matter how vicious that obstruction feels because it keeps returning and returning, we can still get it out. We can throw it out of the mind. That's a noble step. That's a major, major change in one's life. From letting the day be responsible for my bad feelings, or the cop that just busted me, or the jail cell that I'm in, <laughs> or the mother-in-law who is screaming in my ear, or that six-year-old um, brat that won't shut up. <laughs> how about the retreat center? Uh, yeah, right, exactly so. No matter how obstructed the mind gets or how intense it gets, we can say, never mind, start again. Never mind, I can come out of that. This is a major point, and uh, uh, the Buddha makes a big, big deal of this is one's first noble step, noble that's not ordinary, and it's a factor of the path. And that it takes four qualities to be able to do this. What are the four qualities? These are actual parts of the Eightfold Noble Path, the first four of them, which is right view, Right sati, we use right view as a foundation. That's the underlying thing that we start with is when the mind wanders away from the breath and we recognize it, never mind, start again. That's the right, right. view. Then right. we catch it. Then mm -hmm. sati comes up. Mm -hmm. Once sati comes up, now we have to make the effort to actually throw the stuff out of the mind that was in there and or drag the uh, log out of the bog. And by putting that effort in, we come back and we congratulate ourselves into being able to do that. This is now one's new right attitude. Hmm. Because the old attitude was I was a victim. The new attitude is I'm a lion. You've heard that before. <laughs> <Roar>. mm -hmm. <laughs> I can do this. OK, and so now you're talking about that you're actually reporting back. You're actually doing it over and over and over again, no matter how bad the mind got obstructed. So no matter how much the mind gets obstructed, we can come back and begin to develop a new habit, which meant that the old habit that you had that would have lasted all day and really convinced yourself of what a bad day it was may have been more than one day's worth. 
could have lasted several days. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it could yeah. have lasted so many days that you forgot what day it started. <laughs> well, it, it, it would have been a whole identity. Yes, exactly so. So that's why this change of attitude that the Buddha talks about, this right noble attitude, is the attitude of being a winner, being a lion, being above it all, not being stuck in the vagarities of wrong views and ordinary right views, that we're holding a super mundane right view. Mm-hmm. And that super mundane right view is the is, uh, uh, is, uh, view that with careful attention and following the path, there will be a reduction and a further reduction and a deep reduction of suffering. Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing that in operation because you know how bad you could have made yourself feel if you hadn't had some sati to remember to come back and remember to come back and come back. Excellent. Good progress. It's crazy. No, it's called satisfaction. And being satisfied, I suppose, is kind of crazy in England. Do you know anybody in England who is actually satisfied with their life? Do you <laughs> have any other students? <laughs> Pardon? Do you have any other students in England? <laughs> <laughs> actually, yes, but I get your point. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's weird. It's weird. And so, therefore, people who are in a state of satisfaction with recognizing that no matter how obstructed the mind gets, I can come back. Mm-hmm. I can come out of that obstruction and be here now and do it happily and joyfully. That is only crazy to those people who can't do it and have no clue about how to do it and don't believe you because they can't do it. They assume you can't do it. I barely believe I can do it myself. Well, I'll tell you again. Let's go over it again. I asked you if you were going to believe me or not in one time. <laughs> I said barely. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday was my, my proof, really. There's, there's, there's the, the um, value of experiential evidence, direct mm-hmm. experience. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we put this video on YouTube and others hear it, they can get vicarious good results because they say, hey, if Danny can do it, I can do it too. He's a lion, but I'm a lion too. (laughs) I'll take lion cub. (laughs) Well... All all right, I'll take that. Now, here's the question about a lion cub. What's the destiny of that lion cub? To become a lion. To grow up and be a cow? (laughs) (laughs) Actually, we don't know what the destiny is going to be, but the likelihood of him being a cow is really low. (laughs) And the likelihood of him growing up to be a lion is all a matter of skill development. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all a matter of the skill development. So if he develops the skills, and he develops the skills when he knows he can develop the skills. I think one of the major reasons why kids quit practicing music and don't go more than one or two years with it is because they don't believe they can do it. Yes. And that's, um, that's been one reason for the change in my teaching practice of late is, is giving them as much agency as possible over their learning experience so that when they get results, it's their own results. All right. Isn't that what we're talking about here? 
We're just playing a different musical instrument, that's all. <laughs> now we're playing a Danny <laughs> in, the, in the key of C sharp. <laughs> you know, I've actually, I've actually thought of that image. I wrote in my, in my little notes, I kind of like have these, these little kind of thoughts that will help with practice. And I just write them down where I'm likely to see them. And I wrote, play the mind and body like a musical instrument skillfully exactly skillfully but the other but the most important word in there is the word play mm -hmm. that always goes back to it and in fact we can use that word play in the sense of uh making things easy child's play is an act is uh, one of the acronyms but we mm -hmm. always enjoy musicians more when they enjoy doing it themselves. And a performance means that I've got to work at it because I'm not quite up to scratch and I know that. Right, right. But they can go beyond it. In fact, I have noticed that. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. because the old mentality that I had was is in a symphony orchestra situation. Mm -hmm. that everyone is required to perform because if someone is actually in there jazzing things up, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> it, it, will, it will cause trouble, people will get confused, etc. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that in fact is only in a, in a concerto where the cadenza is supposed to be just simply for that musician to play it up a bit. Right. One moment of freedom. For a moment of freedom. They right. get back to the chair. Uh huh. Before he gets back to the task at hand. But yeah. that's still that task at hand for a real Rubenstein is still going to be playful. Right. And that I offer you the distinction if the, the video that I sent you about the, uh, the, uh, the drum off, the drum line. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And did you notice the Ukrainian girls were just having a ball and those boys were just so sexually hung up? <laughs> mm -hmm. And it sounded different. Right. You could hear the macho mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, their, in their drumming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to where the girls were all very playful. And I wonder who their teacher was that got all of those girls, or actually young women, mm -hmm not only the skills that they had to do the performance, but to do it in such a spectacular way. Mm, mm. It, it reminds me of the images on the wildlife documentaries of the birds with the, the, the mating rituals. <laughs> the girls are being all coy and playful and the guys are... <laughs> exactly, Check out my <laughs> And so... Um, the reason that I sent you that was not to watch the boys doing boy things, but to look at the girls because the girls were actually really enjoying what they were doing. They were choreographed, but they were playful. That's the point that we're trying to look at. And if we can bring that quality, not just to a drum line for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. but we can bring that to the way that we live our lives. Mm hmm and yet, seeing everything the, is playful. Yeah, and yet the girls were working inside of a very tight formation. So yes. there, there were rules. There was, they had to be in a certain place at a certain time, but they found the playfulness within the boundaries. Right, exactly. Mm. Exactly so. Viktor Frankl being the ultimate expression of, of this. Uh huh. You could actually go so far as to say that really the intention of the rules for the choreo for choreography is the synchronization towards beauty and away from chaos, which would be called suffering. Mm. All right. And so we use rules. Mm -hmm. If they're used correctly, they will, in fact, remove suffering. And a lot of the rules that we need in society were, in fact, designed to eliminate suffering, but not all of them. I know of a lot of rules that were designed to give me some of your money. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> in fact, most of the rules are designed around that. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I can I can kind of uh, perceive a shift occurring in how I engage with rules, because up to now, most of my relationship to rules has been rebellion. Mm -hmm. But I'm beginning to find I've that noticed. certain. That's one <laughs> <laughs> it's just a stage in life, never mind. <laughs> That's in fact why I've been working with you with daddy issues for so much. Mm -hmm. That's where it showed up first. But yeah, I could recognize you're going to do that authority figure kind of thing. What is it? Yeah. Um, Rubble without a cause. Right. James Dean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a motorcycle movie. What's the name of that? I forgot. It might be, in fact, be Rebel Without a Cause. But yeah. that's the whole idea of the young Western male rebelling against the overly strict rules that his dad and society places on the, the kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, our relationship to rules is an extraordinarily um, interesting um, way of of living our lives because mm -hmm. we don't have very many choices in the Bible. In fact, they talk about it. One uh, one of the places it's a story about that a father has two sons and he asks them both one after another to go out into the field and work. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now one, huh? No, Cain, I don't think Cain, this is no? Cain and Abel. This is okay. something else. Okay, because uh, Cain uh, was different than Abel. Cain was a uh, was a herder mm -hmm. and Abel was a farmer mm -hmm. and that one of the other was one I, I'm not sure exactly which in fact I'm thinking about another story I shouldn't use Cain and Abel there let's not go down that rabbit hole <laughs> let's go mm -hmm. down this one that the father sent to uh, or asked each, each one of his sons to go work in the field and one of them said no the older son and then he went out and worked in the field Okay. The younger son says, okay, daddy, anything you want, daddy. But then he didn't go out and do any work in the field. Mm -hmm. Guess which son became the favored one? The one that went and worked. No, it no. was the one who was agreeable with his dad. Which was not the one that went out and worked? Right. The one said no, went out and worked. The one who said yes, didn't do the work. OK, he, he just agreed to do it. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of our earlier conversation. Regarding my father. <laughs> so the question is, which one is favored? Basically, what happens, in, and this happens in many, many families. I mean, this is human history. Yeah. Generation after generation after generation. And what happens is it's the older boy who rebels. And he winds up right. taking over the, uh, uh, the business and has all the responsibility and does all the work. But he's rebellious one. And uh -huh. then the younger son sucks up to dad is the younger kid in the family always dependent upon the family and he winds up being a nerdy well and do nothing and that's just fine mm -hmm. and it's funny how the ancients so far back that it, this story actually winds up in the bible itself it's actually in there i don't know exactly where but i've known that story was there i saw it in my own family right now, if you have two kids, you can see it. I don't know how it works if there's more or less. Mm, mm. Well, if there's too many less, if there's no kids, then I know how that's going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> but if there's only one kid, he probably has to do both sides of the story. Mm. Which then causes him a conflict, both in the beginning and in the middle. Am I going to rebel against my dad now or later? <laughs> See, I have a younger sister, but she lived with my mom. I lived with my dad. Mm -hmm. 
I can kind of see a yeah, way so in which I did both. Yeah, that's another, that's a new story. I'm looking at traditional families and, and traditional structures. Mm -hmm. um, there's another aspect about that too. And that where I first learned about it was actually from a Latin teacher in high school who mm -hmm. pointed out that almost in, in invariably in a dynasty that the grandfather is a good king his son is a bad king and the grandson becomes a good king again and then the next kid and so every other generation you'll have a benevolent king mixed with a malevolent king mm -hmm. and that part of the reason for that is the relationship between the grandfather and the grandson mm -hmm. because the, the grandfather is going to uh let us say correct a lot of the mistakes that he made with his own son my grandfather showed no affection to my father but was all laughs and jokes with me ah uh, so you can see that in your own family too uh-huh yeah my go dad ahead. go ahead my dad calls my grandfather by his name Oh, well, where do you think you got your authority figure problems from then? <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that your grandfather was wise enough to change his ways. Mm -hmm. Funny how all of this stuff about how families work has been happening for so long over so many generations and some people have actually watched what's going on, recorded it down, and it's been available there for later generations to pick up these patterns. Mm -hmm. These patterns exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonder if they exist in the animal kingdom. I'm not sure. Mm. I'm not sure about that. Animal kingdom, animals are... Let us say this, that I'm, I'm not that much of an expert on him. I'm still trying to get mother-daughter relationships figured out with the dogs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh -huh. that's what we've got here. Yeah, yeah. And they play They even growl at each other, and it's all over jealousy. It's so funny to watch that jealousy issue. Mm-hmm. All that competition right there in the dogs. Yeah, they want petting from you. They want food. Exactly so. And in fact, that's when that one or the other will growl or those two times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, the important thing is that you're, you, you've kind of gotten a hole in your cup now. There's no going back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've had a hole in your cup for quite a while, but you kept trying to patch it up. <laughs> but sorry, it's over now. You know that any suffering that you have is going to leak right out now. Yeah. Because, because you can't stand it being there. We're going to start waking up. And that's, that's the noble path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the first step of the noble path is to say, I'm not going to put up with that stuff anymore. That's that's a good summary of the sentiment. That's that's how it it felt yesterday. Actually, there's a poly word for it that Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa likes very much. That's appropriate here, mm -hmm. and it's called Atam Mayata. Right. That we've talked about before. <laughs> you know, I've had enough of that stuff. Get out, out, out. <laughs> yeah. But it's also part of the Dhamma Nipassana in Anapanasati. It's that relinquishment is saying, hey, out, out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Relinquishment is an interesting angle because it's there's there's an addictive quality. There's certainly familiarity. And it, it, it you know, it's it, it's an identity. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. Whatever you have to let go of, there you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because what we, what, what, how we identify things, or how we identify ourselves, is with our things, our possessions, our ideas, our beliefs, our way of keeping rules, etc., like that. And anything that we start to relinquish, we have to actually say goodbye to myself. There I go. That was yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Or at least a part of me. Uh huh. And part of my identity is now leaking away. But really, it, it was not really a part of me. That was the delusional part, to recognize the right view, because that's the wrong view is relinquishment, but we still cling to that. But the really right view is, hey, traveling through life is a whole lot easier without that burden. Mm -hmm. Wow, I don't need to carry the burden of having a bad day around anymore. <laughs> Surely, if if some identity can be relinquished, it's not authentic. Yes, that's the teaching of the Buddha. Anicca dukkha anatta 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 anatta. The self is delusional. It doesn't really exist. It never did. But we were trained to believe that one existed because of the way society is structured, the way that family is structured, and the way that the instinct of the each individual human is structured. The self-preservation instinct is real, but right. the self that it's guarding is not. <laughs> what a bind. <laughs> what a, right, exactly. Let's do this again. The self-preservation instinct is real, but the self that it's preserving is not. What a mess! <laughs> well, basically, the catch-22 comes from the fact that it's labeled wrongly. That okay. it's not really a self-preservation instinct. It's an organism preservation instinct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's no self there. So yeah. the guys who found it and labeled it and put it in their uh, um, scientific textbooks a hundred years ago made a small mistake. <laughs> I guess they weren't Dama dudes. <laughs> so that's the thing, that that self-preservation instinct is there and it's real and it controls feelings. Mm -hmm. Especially the feelings that are associated with self-preservation, like fear, anger, false bravado, pretending to be um, uh, macho. And you, you watch all of these. I mean, we saw it all of that with all of that macho stuff. None of those young men actually believed that he was as macho as he was pretending to be on stage. <laughs> and that done that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. That self is not real. Uh huh. <clears throat> because deep down inside, whatever self there is that is being protected now is a victim who needs protection. So we're actually diluting and misapplying the self-preservation instinct. Mm -hmm. We're misapplying it. What a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. First you have to fabricate the self, then you have mm. to protect it. Exactly. That's why the Buddha starts with ignorance. That's the primary ignorance. Or another way of saying it, that's the primary magic. The very, very foundation of all magical belief is the magical belief I am. Hmm. Wow. Never considered that magic, but it makes sense.
what was it? Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Right. I shared this one with someone just the other day. <laughs> I think, therefore I think I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the reaction uh, she enjoyed it she enjoyed it very much this is a student of mine who um, shared a, a deep interest in spirituality she um she kind of shared some feelings of being a little dissatisfied with the brand of christianity that that she'd been fed by her family and uh a clear willingness if you find to find anyone who actually is satisfied with their christian bringing up please let me know <laughs> I want to give them a big hug and a kiss and make friends with them and ask them, how does it work for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she was she was clearly open to some discussion around other ways of thinking. And over time, we got to talking more and I've been sharing with her my adventures with you and all about what I'm learning. Mm hmm. Well, now what we can do is you, we can, um, uh, rather than calling someone that you don't know on Skype and introducing yourself takes a little bit of, of gumption or bravado or something like that. So instead of doing that, give her the YouTube. Right. <clears throat> and yeah. play with it and figure uh -huh. out whether anything of value is in there or not great idea you, some of the old videos i'm very surprised to see have one of them has like 400 and something views great and uh uh right now i think we're up to about 85 videos mm -hmm. great and so one of them, by the way, you might enjoy is a, a guided meditation that I, I finally broke down and decided I'm going to do some guided meditations. Okay. <laughs> and so the first one is up uh, okay, right, right. within the past few days. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, part of the, uh, the, the label. When you read down to the list, you'll, you'll find it there as a guided meditation with Zan. Wonderful. So... Anyway, I want to congratulate you for your excellent report. This is really an important thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about what happens later, later. <laughs> 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 but I, I do want to thank you very much for sharing this because this is a major point. Mm -hmm. This is something that I like to hear that somebody is talking about, you know, all day long, having a bad day interspersed with so many waking up and so many waking up. Because you recognize now also in retrospect that the mind is, in fact, not steady state. Some days are actually prone to this is a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and sometimes we can talk ourselves into being in a bad state when, in fact, there's no really reason to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we, but almost always when we do is because we're dwelling on the past. Think about something that's already happened. Yeah, and so yeah, that's yeah. why yeah. it's so valuable to get the past out of the mind and come to the present moment. Yeah. I was unable to identify why yesterday seemed to be hard mode, so to speak, but A, I didn't care, and B, the, the idea that some days will be hard mode, some days will be easy mode, kind of makes a game of it, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And yeah, the, the, the hard mode days will require more energy. That's okay. Because we've got it. <laughs> yeah. We've got it. We can yeah. do this. Yeah. And actually, I stand to, to it's it's a, <laughs> in a strange way, there's a flip because it's a better opportunity for practice. 
Every day is a holiday. <laughs> Every day is a good day to practice. Mm. Every day is a good day to feel good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Danny, thanks. I, I'll talk to you later. OK, Damarate, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, bye-bye. Bye-bye.